Chapter 4 is where we're going to be. This book's kind of broken up into two different sections. You get the first three chapters is Hosea's life, basically. There's some of the prophecy in that, but it's more the reason why for the prophecy and, and how his life is acting it out ahead of time. The Lord tells him to go and marry a woman of harlotry. Uh, he does that, and she goes back to her old life. Uh, they have one child probably they have together, the first one. The, the other two, it appears that she probably has had going back to her old life of harlotry, so they're probably not really Hosea's kids. Uh, we kind of get that, the clue of that from their name. One is uh, Lo Ruama, it means no mercy, no tenderness, and the other is Lo Ami, which is not my people. And so, which is really unfortunate. Gomer's name means co- completion, and Hosea's name means salvation. So what their two names could have come together and meant, had she been faithful, uh, and, and what kind of legacy that could have left would have been amazing. But in the plan, God knew. He knew ahead of time what was going to happen. We saw last week in chapter 3, he was told to go back and, and find her and buy her back. And, and that's what he did. And he bought her for 15 shekels of, of silver, which was like half the price of a, of a servant. It would be 30 shekels of silver, of silver for a servant. So he, he bought her back for half that price. She wasn't worth anything anymore. She couldn't even make a living anymore as a harlot. Uh, Dan's put a map up here for us. Uh, remember, uh, Hosea is a prophet to Israel, which is the northern kingdom in, in uh, purple there. Judah, we're going to see a little warning to Judah from Hosea, but Judah would remain, for the most part, faithful for another hundred years. Uh, Hosea's Prophecy and his attitude toward Israel is kind of like Jer- Jeremiah's is going to be toward Judah. Brokenhearted, Jeremiah's called a weeping prophet. Hosea's prophecies are given out of a broken heart because of his marriage and because of his relationship or non relationship with his wife. They basically have played out what is going on between Israel and, and God. And so that's. Just so you guys have an idea in, in your mind there, we'll keep that up there for you so you know where we're at. But the kingdoms have been divided. We're not far, I think we pointed out last week, from when Elijah has uh, done his uh, battle with Baal and his sacrificing and, and the whole showdown with the, with the prophets of Baal. And, and yet Israel has still forgotten it. They're, they have not maintain that relationship they have not sought after God they have you know done their own thing and that's why God says they've played the harlot uh, what God has provided for them they've turned around and offered to false gods as though they uh, were provided by the false gods and so he's going to bring judgment on them for that he's been a long suffering God the Assyrians are very wicked harsh people are the ones who will carry out this judgment for God. Uh, if you read Jonah, and Jonah's t- uh, dealing with Nineveh, that, those are the Assyrians. And he, he saw them as their great enemy. He didn't want to go. Remember, God basically you know, had a fish swallow him up and take him the rest of the way there. And uh, Jonah's attitude toward Nineveh was, you know, 40 days and you'll get yours, basically. 40 days and destruction comes. And Nineveh repents. God relents. You know, he, he backs off of his judgment on Nineveh, but again, only for 100 years. And a and 100 years later, Nineveh's back to where they were, and God does not show mercy this time. This time, through the prophet Nahum, he, he would pronounce the judgment, and it would be carried out, and Nineveh would be destroyed. Uh, so, God's warning in the word of, of our conduct, of our relationship with him, and, and uh, abiding in him is a, a real thing. Jesus came the first time with grace and mercy and with warning. We, we just saw in Luke, he warned often. He warned of the day of judgment to come. He warned of his second coming. And it wasn't, hey, look forward to that day because most of the people he was talking to were lost. It was a warning to them. You know, come back to God. 
get back into that relationship with God, not just religion, not just the Pharisees and the Sadducees, not all of this extra that you've done to add to God's word, but come back to him in a real way with a real relationship. The door is open to forgiveness. And that's what you have to do. You have to ask for and receive God's forgiveness. But if you don't, the next time you see him, it's going to be judgment. And you won't escape the judgment of God. Israel was warned of this. We're seeing on Wednesday night as we go through Exodus, we actually went through a part and God said, if you make, if you make a covenant with these people, if you take their daughters for your son's wives, you're going to play the harlot. Your sons are going to play the harlot. They're going to begin to worship these other gods. And it's exactly what happened. And God is using the same wording here. This should be ringing in their ears of God's law if we have departed from God's ways, if we have made covenants with these people, if we are worshiping false gods, we are harlots. And it, that in itself, that should be ringing in their ears, but it's not in their ears. And it's not in their ears, we're going to see, because their, their teachers were not teaching God's truth. They were not teaching the law. They weren't teaching anything of God anymore. So let's start with chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. For the Lord brings a charge against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land by swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery. They break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn. And everyone who dwells there will waste away with the beasts of the fields, with the birds of the air, even the fish of the sea will be taken away. So... Here's the, the warning begins. This is not about Hosea's life anymore. These are the prophecies given to Hosea to speak to the, to the children of Israel. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you children of Israel. He wants to come to them as a father. He's tried to come to them as a father. The, Hosea is not the only prophet. Amos has, has prophesied also. Isaiah is prophesying in Judah. Micah is prophesying in Judah. You have all who have gone before. You have the writings of David. You have the, the wisdom of Solomon. You have the books of the law. You have all of that. And you have the story. Well, no, I was, never mind. You, you have these things. You have all these great battles that God has done. You have the story of the deliverance out of Egypt. You have all of that. And I... Over and over in his word up to this point, he's called them his children. He wants that father-child relationship to be there. Trust in me. Look to me for your, 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 your sustenance. Look to me to take care of you and provide for you. And, and at this point, they're coming off of great economic success. They're coming off of great military success. They look untouchable by man's standards. He says, for the Lord brings a charge against the land. They forced him to come as a judge instead of coming as a father. Because they would not heed his words as the father. And we can all think back in our life. Instruction from our parents. Don't go here. Don't do this. Don't make friends with people like this. And we've been given fatherly and motherly advice and given instruction. And we reject it. And we walk away from it. And then mom and dad have to come as judges. Fine. You broke the rules. You won't listen to me. You won't do as I say. Here's your punishment. It's the same thing. This is what God wanted to do with them. And they wouldn't do it. It says there's no truth or knowledge of God in the land by swearing and lying. And the swearing could be by taking false oaths. But it can also mean profanity. And it's amazing to me now in the church how many Christians... Openly swear, openly profane, profane, like it's not a big thing. And they don't care if you're a pastor. They don't care. They may be trying to describe even a situation, and, and, and they'll say things to me like, there's just no better way to say it, no other way to explain it than to say, blah, and they spit the words out. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've got a vivid enough imagination I can figure it out without you swearing in front of me. It used to be in in the day you didn't smoke in front of a pastor. You didn't even if you weren't a Christian. You found out somebody was a pastor. You backed up. You didn't you didn't talk in a rude way or 
there was just that much uh, respect for the church and, and for God and for the Bible because people knew this is what was right and I'm wrong. There's just that, that in us, it tells us that. You know, we didn't just inherit the knowledge of evil from Adam. We inherited the knowledge of good and evil. We know in our hearts what's right and what's wrong. We know in our hearts we need to seek after God. We need to find our creator. That's built into us. You know, John said Jesus was the light in every man or to every man coming into the world. Every single one. There's a light that draws them. And Jesus is that light. And we either go after it or we go our own way. But we know, we know inside of us. By lying, the lies. Listen, this is not, we've drawn some parallels to Israel and America, but this isn't just America. This is personal. We should all be taking this personally. We should all be taking this personally as the church as a whole. This stuff is in the church too. It's not just an individual, and it's not just a nation that we believed was established by God. This is, this is, this is personal, but it's also in the church, and that's, that's disturbing. It should be disturbing. You talk about profanity. I was sharing a story with the worship team on Wednesday night of a pastor that that's his thing, man. At the pulpit, he swears. And, and he's not the only one. There are others who do the same thing. What good is that? What are they proving? You know, it, it's, it's all shock value. I don't need God's word is shocking enough without you having to stand up there and, and try to shock me into waking up to hear your sermon. You know? The lying, uh, the stealing, the killing, the committing of adultery. That's, that's horrible. But if you look at this list, guys, we're all vulnerable to this. We all have our own sin, nature, desires, flesh that we want to go after. And you cannot just go about life and let it happen and think that God is just there to, you know, clean up your mess. Now, unfortunately, that is, again, preached from the pulpit. Sin's okay. Come as you are. We'll embrace you. God will embrace you. Don't have to worry about changing. You don't have to worry about changing your attitude. You don't have to worry about changing your way of life. We'll just embrace it and everything's okay. But that's not true. We're reading here that that's not true. The truth is it's sin and it, it doesn't have any place in us. Now while we're here in this life, we're going to fight against it. But we have to fight against it. And we're going to lose some battles from time to time. But we get back up. We ask God for forgiveness. We, we get in his word because if we stay here, we'll keep cleaning ourselves up. If we're washed by the water of his word, we'll keep cleaning ourselves up. Or he'll clean, keep cleaning us up. Let me put it that way. But if as a believer we walk away from this, we, we get away from it, we start pursuing our own desires, our own lusts, we're going to find ourselves in the pig pen just like the prodigal. It says they, they break all restraint. The law was set to give them some restraint. Don't do these things. The commandments, don't make deals, don't make, uh, don't compromise with these people. Don't take their daughters as your wives for your sons. Don't intermarry with them. Don't, basically, the warning of Paul, don't be unequally yoked with these people. You cannot work together. You can't. A yoke is made custom for the pair of animals that's to work together. Because if it's not made right, one animal is going to make that yoke wear and rub and cause sores on the other animal. It, they can't work together. So yokes were made custom fit for two animals. You had a pair of oxen, you made a yoke just for them. Now when Jesus said, you know, my yoke is, is easy... Well, there was a training yoke also made that you would put on an older animal, and it really was doing all the work. The younger animal was learning how to walk in step and how to walk alongside and how to go in the right direction. It was learning how to do the job 
but all the weight was put on the experienced animal. So being yoked to Jesus, that's what it is. You, you, don't, you don't bear the weight. You don't bear the burden. He does it. You don't really do the work. You're walking alongside him. You're learning how to work. You're learning how to live your life right. But you're doing that because you're walking beside him. You're learning to be beside him. You're being trained by him. But they had bloodshed upon bloodshed. And this was probably, again, a, a reference to Jehu and what he had done and his overzealousness and his attack on Ahab and his family. And, and he went so much farther as a prophet than he was supposed to be to the point where he turned his back on God. And now because of what he had done on behalf of Israel, God is going to visit upon them. That was why he had Hosea, remember, name his first child uh, Jezreel because that's where the judgment was going to take place was in that valley. But again, you have bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore, and that, that points to us, that tells us judgment's coming. Therefore, the land will mourn, literally waste away. And everyone who dwells there will waste away. With the beasts of the field and the birds of the air, and even the fish of the sea will be taken away. So this isn't just going to be the people are going to be taken away. Part of their punishment is going to be to be not just captives, but their land is going to be wasted. Their natural resources are going to be gone. There's not going to be a man in the land who can find a plot of ground where he can plant and say, look, at God's judgment doesn't apply here. And it's the same way with our lives, guys. Our lives will be a waste if we walk away from God. That's why I keep saying a Christian who is not in fellowship with the Lord is the most miserable person on the face of the earth. He cannot find any place in his life where God's blessing is evident, and where he's feeling it, where there's any fruit. God will not bless you if you are in sin, in a believer. He will make it impossible for you to prosper in your sin. He'll let you keep trying. He'll let you keep going until, he's not going to force himself on you. He'll let you keep going until you hit the bottom and you've got no place to look but up. And then he'll be right there for you. You cry out to him finally, and you know this. If you're a believer, you know this. You remember the day you did it the first time. Hopefully. But even their natural resources are going to be taken away. He says, now let no man contend or rebuke another. For your people are like those who contend with the, with the priest. Therefore you, shall say, <clears throat> therefore you shall stumble in the day. The prophet also, also <laughs> shall stumble with you in, in the night. And I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being priests for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. So you have, tell them, don't, don't contend, don't rebuke. Listen, if you're in sin, you got no business rebuking other people. You don't. What did Jesus say? You get the, get the log out of your own eye before you go trying to pull the speck out of your brother's eye. Right? It, it, now, if you, if you feel like you should be going and confronting a brother or sister on, on something in their life, and I think that that's part of our job as believers and brothers and sisters, we go to each other and say, hey, listen, this is, this is what I'm seeing. This is, but you better go humble. You better go understanding you're a sinner too. You better go and with a right heart. You better pray, Lord, is there anything in my life first? Deal with me first and then I'll go. Because if you just charge in, and you just start pounding away. You're not doing anything. You're not, you're not coming to bring God's grace and his mercy and his healing to that person's life. You're coming just to, like you're coming to slay the wicked. And that's not what we're supposed to do. See, for your people are like those who contend with the priest. Therefore you shall stumble in the day. The prophet also shall stumble with you in the night. They were, they were looking to false prophets on purpose. Even in Jeremiah's time later, they'll call Jeremiah in. Tell us what the Lord, where the Lord is. And he gives them the bad news. And they say, oh, call all the other prophets in. And they tell the king what he wants to hear. 
And the king embraces what he wants to hear instead of what the true word is from God. And it brings trouble on him. That's going to happen. It's happening now. It's happening now. It's happening in our nation with our, with our politicians, but it's also happening in the church with the pastors. It's happening. We're telling people what they want to hear because we want to make sure the pews are full because this is a, this is a job. This is an organization. This is, you know, I'm a CEO. I'm a CFO. I'm a, this is, I got to make this run right. I got to make it do all these things to be a success. You can't do that telling these people that they're sinners and they're all going to go to hell. Listen, God held these guys accountable for this. In Isaiah 56, it starts off with God talking about giving salvation to the Gentiles. Verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness to, the, to be revealed. Uh, blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord uh, speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose the, what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant. Even to them I will give my house, or give in my house, and within them, and within my walls, a place and a name better than the, that of the sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to serve the Lord to love the name of the Lord, to, uh, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath uh, and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Lord God who gathers the outcast of Israel says, Yet I will gather him, to him, others besides those who are gathered to him. But then he comes down on the priests and on the on the on the leaders of this nation of Israel, and for their lack of making Israel and teaching Israel, and and they were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They weren't supposed to be thinking that they were above and self righteous against the Gentiles. They were supposed to be a light and draw them in. But verse 9 says, All you beasts of the field come to devour, all you beasts of the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yes, they are greedy dogs, which, have ne or which never have enough. And they are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain, for his own territory. Come, one says, I will bring wine and, be, and we, will be, <coughs> we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today and much more abundant. And so these, these, these prophets and the, and the priests and the, the, even the political leaders, the kings, and especially in Israel, there was not one, not one king in, in the northern kingdom that was a good king. There's not one that said of it that he did what was right in the sight of God. There's not a king of Israel that did that. But here it even says the prophets are going to fall in the dark with the people. They're purposely leading them astray. Now the warning of that for our time too, isn't it? Jude is all about that. A one chapter book. It's all about the false prophets and the false teachers that are going to rise up in the last day. Paul wrote about them. Peter wrote about them. Jude wrote about him. John wrote about him. Everybody has warned us. Everybody who's written the scriptures. Jesus warned about them. And they say, here I am, don't go. You'll know when I come back. There's not going to be any mistaking it. You won't have to go find him. 
We read that in Luke. We read it in Matthew. The lights go out. The stars go out. The sun goes out. There's nothing but the glory of the Son of God coming back to the earth. Everybody will know. But until that day, we have to take heed to this. We have to, we have to remember. And, and, and we're going to war against this, guys, to the, to the very end now. We are, we are either in a combination of two church ages with Philadelphia and, and Laodicea, or it's all Laodicea. We're in that church age now where, where the church is turning away from God. We're in the church age now where they don't recognize that they need a God. They think they're rich. They think they're okay. Everything's all right. There's nothing wrong with me. And what did Jesus say? You don't even know. You don't know that you're poor, that you're destitute, that you're naked. You don't even know. We have so justified our sins within ourselves and being able to act on them and do whatever we want that we don't even know we're wrong anymore. We don't even know it. We can look at God's word and we can twist it and turn it and make it whatever we want. And we misrepresent God. And there are pastors, big church, small church, doesn't matter. There are pastors in all of them that are experts at it. They don't want confrontation. They don't want to have to correct anybody. They don't want to have to speak the wrong thing for fear that people are going to leave or that they're going to be persecuted. They don't want it. You know, and and the, the guy in the small church is envious of the guy in the big church, and so he tells the same lie the guy in the big church is in the hopes that God's going to bless him and he's going to have a big church. And they're just so wrong. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The people didn't know anymore. They didn't know what was right or what was wrong. They came to the temple. They heard whatever they wanted to hear. Whatever the, the priest would tell them, whatever they wanted. Justify whatever you want. Live however you want. You sacrifice to this God on this day, great. That's fine. You do that as long as you're here on the Sabbath day, that's good. And it was all religion. It was just religion. Empty Religion didn't mean anything. And the people were destroyed because the priests weren't teaching anymore. They themselves, we saw in Isaiah, they're getting drunk, they're doing their own thing, chasing after their own lusts and desires. And listen, if I want the freedom to be able to do this, then I better tell everybody else they're free to do it too. Right? God hasn't removed me from my position, so it must be okay. How... That's not right. They will one day stand in front of God face to face to answer for that. And you know who else is going to? Everybody who followed them. You don't get out of the judgment because you followed a false teacher and therefore because he said it, now it's not on me, it's on him, and, it's, and so I'm okay because I'm I'm deceived. Well, if you can justify it in that roundabout way, you're not deceived. You know what you're doing. You know who you're following. Get out from under it. You need to. And the word destroyed is cut off. My people are cut off. Remember the name of, of the first, or of, the, of the, the third child? Not my people. Lo ami, not my people. You don't want to be sitting in a church on a Sunday and Wednesday and whatever other day the church is open and still have God say over you, low on me. You're not my people. He warned us of this. He said, many are that day are going to stand in front of me and say, Lord, Lord. And he's going to say, I don't know you. I don't know you. Yeah, but didn't we do all of these things? Didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we heal people? Didn't we, all in your name, didn't we do all of that? But I don't know you. I don't know you. You never, you never came to me. You never asked me to forgive you of your sin. 
You put on a great show. But you never asked me. You never cried out to me. Everything you did was for you. There's nothing left that you did for me. And forget about do for me and forget about doing my name. It doesn't mean anything, guys, if we don't already have given God our heart. It doesn't mean anything. We can be good. We can keep our tongue from swearing and being profane. We can be faithful to our husbands and wives. We can be faithful at work. If we have not given our heart to the Lord and asked for His forgiveness, there is no forgiveness in your life. Your sin is still there. You're still chasing after it. And coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. And being an American doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is actually being a Christ follower. That's what it means. That's what Christian means. A Christ follower. In all of this stuff. All this stuff is so rampant in the church. You go clubbing on Friday and Saturday and Sunday morning is just another club to go to. And that's, that's washed over into the mission field. I've been told by people who, who run a mission organization that that's a big thing in the mission field now. The missionaries are, are serving alcohol at Bible studies. That they're going out, the missionaries' wives are going out clubbing together. It shouldn't be. If any of you guys, I'll tell you right now, if any of you guys, I find out you go out in the mission field and I find out you're doing that stuff, you better hope God gets a hold of you before I do, because I'm coming. You're going to have your pastor standing on the door. If somebody from a mission organization calls me and says, hey, this person's misrepresenting God, I'm coming for you. I'll pack your bag for you and send you home. It's ridiculous, you guys. We know better. We know better than this. And if you're doing those things here at home, God is not going to bless your life. It's not going to happen. You can't do one thing on one day and be here the next day, and that makes everything okay. Verse 7 says, The more they increase, the more they sinned against me. And that's a direct charge against the priest. The more they increase, the more they sin. And we see it again. It's, it's the religious leaders of our time, the more they increase, the more they sin. And guys, it's even touched Calvary Chapel. We're not, we're not untouchable in that. There are guys that have gotten up every Sunday, faithfully teach God's word verse by verse, just like Pastor Chuck taught us to and just like they tell us to, teach it right on, and they still fall. As recently as a couple months ago. The more they increase, the more they sin. I will change their glory into shame. They eat up the sin of my people. They set their heart on their iniquity, and it shall be like, and it shall be like people, like priests. So I will punish them for their ways, and reward them for their, for their deeds. For they shall eat, but not have enough. They shall commit harlotry, but not increase, because they have ceased obeying the Lord. It's all about obedience. And we can say, well, we're not under the law, Glenn. Under grace. Well, you need to go read Romans. Go read Romans and, and look at Paul's instruction there. Do we sin more so God's grace can abound more? No, absolutely not. Look at all the commandments in the New Testament. There are not commandments in the New Testament. Yeah, there is. There's lists. This is the works of the flesh. This is, this is the works of, of lust. And this is what happens. And this is the work of the Spirit in our lives right here. And 
If you practice these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's still there. And he says here, like priests, like people. If you are a follower of these people who are justifying your sin for you, your end is the same as theirs. It says, so I will punish their ways. And we see, we're not going to prosper in our sin. It's not going to happen. It might look like it. The song we read this morning, that was part of the psalmist, right? Why do they prosper? Why, why does the wicked still look like they're getting ahead? But God's promise is they don't. See, if you really want to prosper, you're storing up for yourself treasure where? Exactly. And that's where your prosperity is. But if you're doing the work of God and you're preaching the word of God so you can store up treasure here, you're going to get your reward. You're still committing the harlotry. So they're going to eat but not have enough. That, that, is, that is one of the hardest things for wealthy people is to be able to say, this is enough. I don't need any more. I'm, I'm satisfied. I've got a million dollars, I'm satisfied. No, what do you want to do? You take that million dollars and we'll put it to work for me. I'm going to have five million dollars by the end of the year. I'm going to have $10 million next year. Now listen, God blesses some people and with an overabundance. And, and some people are able to handle that and stay true to it and use it to further the kingdom, and they do. So it's not wrong to be wealthy. But it's wrong to let your wealth have you and be consumed by it. And, and, and it directs your life, and it it grabs a hold of you and it has all of your attention. You know, if you're sitting in church on Sunday and wondering what the stock market's going to do tomorrow when it opens up instead of listening to what's being taught, you're in, you, your head's in the wrong spot. Your heart's in the wrong spot. You want to put it to work for you? Put it to work in God's kingdom. Be wise with it. Be good stewards with it, but put it to work in God's kingdom. But listen, in our sin, we're not going to increase. Not in, God's, not in God's economy. You're not going to increase. It'll look good on paper. It'll look good in a bank account. But it's not really increasing in God's eyes. It's all going to be gone. It's all going to be gone. One day, you're going to stand in front of him, and it, you could, <laughs> the bank statement won't mean anything. Listen, you can be poor and you can desire the same thing. Your heart can still be in the same place even if you don't have that stuff. You know that? You can be absolutely, absolutely just getting by, barely getting by, but be so consumed with if I had a little more, if I had a little more, if I do this one more thing, if I work a couple extra hours, if I move this, if I do this, if I could only, and that's your only prayer to God. If I could, if you would just give me another job, then I could do this and I could do that. I could even give more to the church. Listen, man, be content with where you're at. Don't worry about your treasure here. Worry about your treasure in heaven. Because if you're consumed by wanting more, it doesn't matter if you have a lot or you have a little. If you're consumed by wanting more, your heart and your head are in the wrong place. It's in the wrong place. Harlotry, wine, new wine, enslave the heart. You want a verse against drinking? There's one for you right there. Harlotry, wine, and new wine, enslave the heart. My people ask counsel from their wooden idols, and their staff informs them. For the spirit of harlotry has caused them to stray, and they have played the harlot against God. Now, there's a lot of us here who've taken verse 11, and we, we've, we've had the wine and the new wine. And we've had our hearts enslaved. And we made horrible decisions after that, and we sought counsel after people 
we had no business going to. And it just got us more trouble. And these, these people are doing the same. They're, they're looking to idols, wooden idols. They're talking to their staff. You know, they're using divination, basically, is what, what's going on here. Right? Th- this, is, this is getting my head and getting in touch and, and using whatever chemicals I want to use, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, and, and get my mind loose so I can think and I can do whatever and I can just float by and, oh, yeah, this little thing over here is talking to me. God sent me a message through a plant. No, he didn't. He <laughs> didn't do that. Even Belshazzar didn't get his message from a wall. He got it from the finger of God writing on the wall. The spirit of harlotry has caused him to stray. If you belong to God, you do not belong to anybody else or anything else. There's so many people out there, and it's amazing to me, people that you think and people that have been in the past solid in the Word of God, and they're still getting tricked and led slowly but surely into wrong paths. It's not all at once. It's slow but sure. And they've played the harlot against their God. Literally, they have gotten out from under. The word against could be translated out from under. They have gotten out from under their God. Out from under his covering. What did, what did Jesus say when he prayed over Jerusalem? He was weeping over Jerusalem. How long have I ga- longed to gather you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks? Come back under me. If you're not walking with the Lord, get back under God. Get back under his word. Get back under his covering. Get back under his protection. So they offer sacrifices on the mountaintops, burn incense on the hills, under their oaks and poplars and terebinths because their shade is good. Therefore their daughters commit harlotry and their brides commit adultery. This is all religion now. And the prostitution is going on in the church, or in the temple, I'm sorry, not in the church, but in these religions. These prostitutes are are regular prostitutes and uh, temple prostitutes. And they're, they're, they're going after these false religions because it makes them feel good. There's a lot of feel-good messages in the church now. And they're not all right. They're not all right. I mean, I want you to going away from church every Sunday morning all bummed out. That's not what I'm saying. You shouldn't be doing that either. But if God's word is speaking to you and convicting you, then get broken before God, but then get filled up with his joy. He doesn't just break you down and leave you in a pile in a heap. He wants you to be broken. He wants you to have a broken and contrite heart and a completely utter destroyed heart in front of him. He wants that so he can build you back up and lift you back up and fill you with the joy the world doesn't understand and the peace that the world can't conceive. And he he wants to build you up. He resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. He will lift you up. Even their brides were committing, their wives were committing adultery. And that maybe is a reference directly to Gomer, but maybe Gomer's not the only, not the only prostitute who's married to somebody. So I will not punish your daughters when they commit harlotry, nor your brides when they commit adultery, for the men themselves go apart with harlots and offer sacrifices with a ritual harlot. Therefore, the people who do not understand will be trampled. It's not... It's on the men. The men evidently are upset because their wives are doing the same thing they're doing. 
I'm not punishing your daughters. I'm not going to punish your wives. Just because you don't like it, you're doing it yourself. Listen, I'm going to just speak for myself, but probably every parent here can, can look to a point in your life and decision that you made and look at how it has affected your kids and their lives. And you can see that their walk with God, if we're honest, is a, is a direct uh, picture or, or it's a direct result of a decision we made, bad or good, to follow God or to reject Him. And it's washed over into our kids. And no matter where we're at right now, our kids look back to that moment. And they use it to justify them. And that's, that's hard. That's hard. It's a hard weight to carry. And, and listen, I don't care how old you are, if you're, if you're looking back at one of your parents' moments to justify where you're at, stop it. Because that's bitterness that's taking root in your heart and you're using it to not do what God wants you to do. Let go of it. Forgive your parents. I don't care if they've asked for it or not. I don't care if you think they deserve it or not. Forgive them and let it go. And move forward from today with walking with the Lord. And quit using mom and dad to justify where you're at. And listen, if mom and dad are solid... Now, but they weren't before. Don't look at that model either. Scared to death that my kids would look at that model of me and say, well, dad was like this for, you know, five, ten years. And then God got a hold of me, came back, and now look at him. He's already right. He's a pastor. And look, at everything's good. So I've got some time. You don't know that you have time. You don't know that. That's not promised anywhere. But what we're seeing right here is no matter what you use to justify where you're at, no matter what you use to justify your sin, you're not going to prosper in it. And why, why would you look back at a bad time in your parents' life full of bad decisions and bad choices and bad ways to go and say, because dad came out of it, I'll come out of it, let me go. Why would you do that? Because you can look at that time frame too and see how miserable he or she was. Why would you want to embrace that? Because here's the deal. If we've shared with our kids and we know the moment that we, that we, we took and, and we made that decision that made us miserable for a time, we've also shared with you the moment where we said, what was I doing? And hard times come after that too, but it's not the same. It's not the same. And we do not, do not, do not want you to fall into this where the iniquity of the Father is being visited upon the children in the next generation. We don't want that. We came back, and one of our hopes in coming back after we're reestablished with the Lord is our kids would not suffer a consequence because of our sin, that our kids would not follow in those footsteps of our sin. We don't want that. We, we hope and pray that God will spare you of that. What we want is what I got yesterday. And I've, I've shared most of my testimony, and most of you, some of you heard all of the testimony. But you know, there was a, a point, God used my oldest daughter, Hope. She was the only child then. She was the only child for 10 years. God got a hold of my heart through that little girl. And, and it wasn't long after that when I made that decision. I'm coming back. I'm coming to the church. I'm going back no matter what. No matter what, I'm not leaving this again. I'm not moving away from this again. I'm going and I'm staying. And 
yesterday, we get a message that a four-year-old little granddaughter gave her heart to the Lord during the family devotions last night. That's what we want. That's what we long for. But there was that moment standing over Hope's bed, telling her goodnight, and the Lord clearly spoke to me and said, whatever way you go, that's the way she's going. Where would my granddaughter be today? Where would she be in 10 years if I hadn't made that right choice? Not every choice has been right since then. But it's every day on the grace of God. Every day. Where would she, what, what would be going on? Where would hope be? Where would all the rest of my kids be? These had rejected God. And because people weren't teaching them anymore, they weren't teaching rightly anymore, they, they were being destroyed. Now we have a warning to Judah. I'm going to wrap up with this next couple of verses. It says, Though you, Israel, play the harlot, let not Judah offend. Up to this point, they have not completely abandoned God. They had some bad kings, but they had great kings too, like, like Hezekiah and Josiah, the ones who tore down the temples and tore down the high places and smashed the idols. Judah. Let not Judah offend. Do not come up to Gilgal, no go, nor go up to Beth. Beth Avon, nor swear an oath saying, As the Lord lives. For Israel is stubborn like a stubborn calf. Now the Lord will let them forage like a lamb in open country. You know what happens to a lamb when you turn it out in the open country? No more pasture, no more fences, no more shepherd. They get eaten up. The predators come. Says Ephraim has joined the idols, let him alone. Their drink is rebellion. They commit harlotry continually. They, her rulers dearly love dishonor. The wind is wrapped her up in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. There comes a day, guys. There comes a day when you've got to cut people off. You have to. Your friends, people you hang out with, tell them about Jesus. They reject it. Walk away. There's a time to cut them off, to get away from it. Because I'm telling you now, if you hang around and hang around and hang around, you're the one that's going to get dragged down. If I, if I had Dylan come up here and stand right here on the corner of this stage, and I stood down there, he could try to pull me up with all the strength that he has, a strong young man. He could pull me up. And all it would take is one good jerk, and he'd be right down where I was at because I'd have the leverage. Listen, it's what happens. You hang around with the world, you go to their places, you do their things, you're going to be with them. You're not going to pull people up by staying there and going to their places and participating in their life. If they will come with you and they will participate in your life with Jesus, their lives are going to be changed. But it comes a day you've got to cut them off. And even family. We don't like to hear that. A lot of times we'll say, well, you know, this, this uncle, I can't really cut my uncle off, can't really cut my cousin off, can't really cut my brother or sister off. Guess what? There's a day you have to. These people were blood. These were relatives. Israel was a relative of Judah. Twelve tribes. These weren't just acquaintances. This wasn't old life, new life. This was blood, blood relationship. And the Lord says, cut them off. Leave them alone. Ephraim's joined the idols. Leave them alone. Their drink is rebellion. They commit harlotry continually. Her rulers dearly love dishonor. Listen, every time one of your friends or one of your relatives calls you, wants to get reacquainted with you, Wants to, you know, hey, man, I'm having a party. Come on over. I know, you know, you don't do this stuff anymore, but come and hang out. No, how about I tell you about Jesus right now? So how fast to hang up the phone. 
Tell you what, I'm having a Bible study at my house. Why don't you come to that? And don't make the deal, if you come to my Bible study, I'll go to your party. Don't do that. Right? The warning to these people was don't make deals with the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and all the other ites. Don't make deals with them. Because if you do, if you do, you'll play the harlot. Don't make deals with them. It's, it's one way. God doesn't make a deal with you. He doesn't say, well, hey, you know what? If you'll give up this part of your life, I'll let you keep that part. He doesn't do that. Confess your sins and I'll, I'll forgive you. But come to me and stay with me. And, and don't walk in that way anymore. He didn't say to the woman caught in adultery, hey, you know, only do this once a week or only do this once a month or hey, you know. Yeah, he said, go and sin no more. Don't do this anymore. You were caught because you were doing something you weren't supposed to be doing. I understand these guys set you up, but you were still doing something you weren't supposed to be doing. He didn't let her out of it. He just said, I'm not accusing you because he already knows. He didn't have to accuse her. She knew what she was. He knew what she was. He said, I'm not going to accuse you. Go sin no more. Just don't do it anymore. Yeah. I'm telling you, because I've lived it, if you go where they're at, instead of having them come to where you're at with Jesus, it won't be long where you'll spend more time there than you will with Jesus. It won't be long. And you'll have more friends in the world than you'll have in the church. And those friends are not friends. And you'll start seeking your counsel in the world instead of seeking your counsel in the church. Why? Because you already know what's right and wrong. You're not going to come to me because you know what I'm going to say. You're not going to go to mom and dad because you know what they're going to say. You're not going to go to your brother in the Lord because you know what he's going to tell you. I don't need to ask them. I already know what they're going to say. You're going to go ask Joe Pothead what he wants you to say. You know? Stop it. Quit going to the wrong places. What did the angel say to the women? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Church, we got to quit looking for life in the dead world. Our life is not there. And if we're going to bring life into this world, we got to keep breathing Jesus' life. we got to keep staying there. Keep moving on with him. It's hard. I know it's hard. I've been there. I've lived it. I know it's hard. It's not easy. But your friends, your family need to be in Christ. I'm not saying don't have any. You got to have acquaintances. You got to know. You got to talk to the world. You got to work with them. You are going to have family. But it's the ones who keep trying to drag you into that, cut them off. Don't go to the parties. You know, whatever. Don't, just don't. You draw them into Jesus, right? You be the door. You be the light. You be the salt. You be everything that Jesus wanted you to be. You go their way, it's going to be the wrong way. Guaranteed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the warnings that you've given us. And Lord, we see that nothing's changed. There's no new sin. There's no new attitude of evil. It's always been there. Since Adam fell, it's been here. But thank you, Lord, that since Adam fell, the war has been on. Thank you that you've won. You've already won. You went to the cross. You paid the price. Hell has no hold on us as long as we've given our life to you. 
Lord, just as the psalmist was saying, everything looks more attractive. It looks good. It looks prosperous. Lord, give us the eyes to see. I pray that everybody here would have their eyes open this week to see what evil looks like. Not just what your grace and mercy look like, Lord, but what evil really looks like. So that they won't want to touch it. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you for all you've done. For calling us. For giving us your word. Revealing your truth to us, Lord. Lord, I pray that everybody has some discernment to be able to know false teachers and good teachers. Those who speak your word in truth and those who would twist and make it a lie. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come upon everybody this week to be able to learn your word and comprehend your words as they go through their daily devotion time, their prayer time, Lord. I pray that you would just begin to turn our lives around and turn it not inward but outward so that people who do come into our contact with us, people who do come into our lives, people who do walk into this church, into our businesses, into our schools, those people would see a different person standing there in front of them and want to know what we have. Lord, I pray that you would, like Moses, make us a shining beacon, something that would draw those people out of the world. And Lord, may we learn from the reason the mistakes and the the things that other people have done ahead of us, whether it be these stories about your people Israel or whether it be those that we see around us. Learn from those mistakes, not react to what we see, but be able to think clearly and, and, and have some common sense about us to be able to know what's of you and what is not. Lord, I pray you forgive us of our sin and draw us close to you. In Jesus' name, amen.